Thank you guys. Uh, I'd like to echo Dr. Miller's sentiments. Uh, the fact that you are all here today really speaks volumes to um, your support for the military. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out today. Um, you know, I wasn't sure if there was going to be a big enough crowd, so I paid all my friends and family to come out and support me. So I know one way or the other I'm going to get some clapping and, and laughs throughout the, uh, throughout the speech. So, uh, Dr. Miller, thank you for that very gracious introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I can't begin to tell you how great it is to be back at Blair and getting the opportunity to provide some insight into military service and my experiences in Afghanistan. There's some things I really miss about Blair. Uh, Petty Day Bonfire comes to mind. Uh, a spring day near the arch. What I really miss, uh, I think most of all, is the fact that I used to have this great head of hair back in the day. <laughs> kind of like that guy right there. The guy who's got a... Uh, <laughs> he's got a he's got some, <laughs> some of the faculty that uh, haven't seen me in a while were really aghast. I think Mr. Spring, I kind of threw him for a loop. He wasn't sure. He, I was his... Uh, I was his uh, advisor. He was my advisor back in the day. I don't think he recognized me, but... If you haven't figured it out yet, um, you guys are part of a special place. Blair is a special place, and you're incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to be sitting here. I wish I could say that that was because you're here to listen to me, but in reality, you sitting here means you're part of a community that encourages independent thought and critical thinking. You're part of a community that takes care of one another and values the product that comes out of this institution. There's an interesting algorithm going on here. You're all kind of a part of it. I was a part of it a few years back, and in my 10 years away from Blair, I've come to value and appreciate it further. I know we all get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, but I want to take a quick moment to remind you how lucky we are to be a, be a part of a community like this. Make it count, and lean on the things you learn here and let them be your compass as it guides you forward. For what it's worth, it hasn't steered me wrong thus far. Uh, my, dust, my discussion today will focus on my experience as a lieutenant in the United States Army. Um, some of those experiences were extremely positive, and providing me an invaluable perspective on life. Others are extraordinarily painful and will remain part of who I am indefinitely. I struggled kind of with how much detail and what to, to what degree I would explain my experiences, partially for the preservation of the audience and partially for the preservation of, of um, and partially for my own self-preservation. Some of the topics are a bit heavy and I certainly do not claim to have the answers to many of the difficult situations we encountered. Uh, these, are, uh, these opinions that I have are driven by my experiences, and I encourage you to be critical of them. Uh, I would also like to add that no question is too sensitive, and please ask the hard questions. And uh, before I launch uh, forward, uh, I'd like to thank my family for being here specifically. Uh, families too often overlooked in the military, in military service, and believe me when I say they struggle with you, and, uh, but they do so with imperfect information and with very limited support structure. I was lucky to have them in my corner. And would like to thank them specifically for being here and supporting me today and for their support and all that they've done. Let's see if I can get these slides working here. Okay. All right, so my, uh, my speech is entitled Afghanistan of Boots on the Ground Perspective. As you know, I was a lieutenant uh, deployed forward in the Kunar province, Afghanistan. Uh, I kind of want to take a big picture, kind of to start off, and why Afghanistan is such a difficult place to operate. Uh, first and foremost, the Pashtun tribal belt. And what you have here is you've got Afghanistan proper. It's kind of outlined. It's kind of outlined here. Um, and what's difficult is you've got Pakistan to the immediate east. Um, you've got Iran to the west. You've got some really heavy influencers that are really disrupting operations and what we're doing there. Back in the early 1900s, a guy by the name of Mortimer Durand, who was a British uh, surveyor, came in and put this innocuous line right down the center of Afghanistan and divided what is Pashtunistan. And Pash the Pashtunistan is the green area. That's the larger tribal group that really is the um, biggest part of the population in Afghanistan. When he put this line down the center, it really divided that community in half and uh, really created some issues that we're kind of still dealing with today. Uh, Pashtun Wali is a code that the Afghans live with, live by over there, and it kind of drives their day-to-day -day actions. Um, some of the things that are included in that, the tenets of it are hospitality, uh, asylum for those who seek refuge, justice, bravery, loyalty, and 
honor of women. These things are important to note because when you're dealing with the local Afghan population, you have to realize you have to deal with them in the, in the context of Pashtun Wali. All these things serve to increase what they call their nang, their respect for one another. The more nang you have, the better off you are as a, as a Pashtun. And it's important to know that when you're dealing with the Afghan population that you work within, the, within those constraints. A big, a big thing that we're dealing with now additionally is the Pakistani, a Pakistani politics constraining operations. As most of you know, um, the FATA, the federally administered tribal area, exists here in the northwestern corner of Pakistan. Uh, it is lawless. Uh, that is where many of the terrorist factions that you hear day to day reside. It's really the head of the snake in terms of who we're trying to get get to and, and, and rid from, from Afghanistan. But really, a lot of the problems are driven from that area. And then obviously of exterior influences, large players such as Iran and China who come in and affect things both uh, through financing as well as through arms and, and so on and so forth. Throughout Afghanistan, they're continuing to play a factor in everything that we do. The last kind of thing I want to touch on before I drive on is Afghanistan is not Iraq. It's very different. We went into Iraq, there was a lot of infrastructure already in place. Um, though Iraq was ruled by a dictator, he had put a lot of the systems in place to make it uh, a very livable society. There were things that united it. You had a, a common television station, you had basic resources and, and necessities to go about your day-to-day -day life were provided for you by that regime. In Afghanistan, you don't have that. You have various tribal areas that are distinctly different from one another and they're not bound together by any uh, any real one thing, whether that be a national media or a leader. And that's also very important as you're looking at things and through the context of why Afghanistan is a tough place to operate. Okay, kind of going down into where I specifically was, Kunar province, um, taking a look at specifically this region. Um, just geographically, you see as you proceed sort of in a, if you proceed to the northeast, the mountains, uh, the geography of Afghanistan gets a lot more difficult to operate in. Uh, you see, this is the red area. This is pretty much where my platoon uh, resided day to day. Uh, Kunar in general is a very little strategic value to the overall war. The strategic reason for us operating there is generally to fight the enemy away from the, the city centers. So most of uh, what we're trying to protect in Afghanistan exists in Kabul and Kandahar. Operating here close to the Fatah, the area I kind of described earlier where things are lawless. If we can interdict the enemy in some of these outlying areas like Kunar, hopefully we can fight them on our terms away from places effect effectively that really matter. Places of governance where we're trying to establish a strong democracy. Obviously, the Fatah as a refuge comes into play. Uh, one of the more frustrating things for us is we would spend day in and day out fighting these guys, trying to get them into a position where they don't affect the local population, where they, they can't affect good governance and rule of law that's going on in Afghanistan. And when you're done fighting them, they go back to Pakistan, they go back to the Fatah, they lick their wounds, um, they have the ability to refit, plan, have some exterior influence, exterior influence and, and uh, funding from uh, Al-Qaeda sources from Egypt, generally speaking, and they would be able to refit and come back and attack us another day. Even within Afghanistan, Kunar is tribally disconnected from the, the rest of Afghans. As you can see the geography lends itself to that, and a particularly interesting story uh, I tell often is we went to a real remote village in Kunar, and I went, I talked to the tribal elder, a guy that looks like Father Time, you know, real old, long, white beard. Uh, and I go up to this guy, and I introduce myself, and he, through an interpreter, obviously, he spoke Pashtun, and he said to me, I thought the Russians had left. <laughs> and this is, you know, years, 20 plus years at this point, since the last Russian had had, uh, had left, and he honestly still believed that the Russians were a part of Afghanistan. Um, further, when I kind of probed, just for my own curiosity, you know, do you know who the president of your country is? 
had no clue. Their sphere of influence of things that that they dealt with on a day to day, you know, that was that was not part of their their psyche. It wasn't anything that they ever had to deal with. So that's the kind of people you're dealing with in this area. Our strategy, we want to fight the enemy on our terms. I kind of spoke to that a little bit earlier. We had to recognize that the enemy has a vote and that they're capable and hard. These guys are, um, they may be uneducated, they may not have all the resources, but they had to lay of the land. They spent day in, day out walking at 10,000 plus feet. They're hard people, they're willing to fight, they're willing to go toe to toe with you on a daily basis. And they're not afraid, and they believe in what they're doing. We're exceptional as a military, not because we're superhuman. You know, my guys, toe to toe, pound for pound, look similar to the type of guys we're fighting. What makes us special as a military is the fact that we bring a lot of other resources to bear. American exceptionalism, all the weaponry, um, the intelligence, uh, the air support. Without those sort of things, when you compare us to them, there's not a lot of differences in terms of, of the way we fight. Tactically, they're very, they're very sound. They do a lot of the same things we do. What makes us different, what makes us better is our ability to bring those influencers to bear to fight them. Furthermore, our, stat our strategy is to relentlessly engage the local population. You really have to understand your backyard. The only way to do this is to engage, engage the population on a daily basis. You have to build lasting relationships of trust and back up your promises. Broken promises equate to losing the favor of the local population. I'd much rather have a hard discussion with these folks about not being able to provide a resource than come up short on a promise. We're already behind the eight ball as compared to the enemy in that we don't practice the same religion or have strong familial ties like some of, our, some of the facilitators in the area that try to affect uh, the way these guys operate. Each and every interaction that we, that we have with them counts. We have to make an impression. We have to be able to influence. The third strategy that we employed on a daily basis was to not deny the enemy influence on Afghan decision makers. To the best of our ability, we had to allow rule of law and governance to go about its daily business without interference from these external actors poking holes in what they were trying to do. Easier said than done most of the time. You know, the guys that get it on the enemy side are going to attack everything that smells like democracy. Uh, they do a very good job of, of of really getting at and threatening leaders. Um, and that was a huge challenge for us. Day to day, those guys were getting midnight letters, you know, something tacked on the door that says, if you continue to work with the Americans, we're gonna kill your family, we're gonna kill you. You know, all of them were going above and beyond, in my opinion, to continue to serve in that capacity. A lot of our focus was on military age males. The thought being there, if you can employ that part of the population, if you can go after men that are going to be fighting, you keep them occupied, you keep them, you know, working towards other ends, you're going to be successful in, in being able to marginalize some of the enemy that continues to try to influence your area of operations. And lastly, we had to try to win the information campaign. We worked extraordinarily hard to try to get at the population before the enemy did. Spin control is absolutely paramount. The enemy has equal, if not better, access to the population because they live amongst them. They're continuously trying to poison the well by spreading messages counter to ours. They quickly take your successes and turn them into negative propaganda if you don't quickly and effectively engage the population with the truth. As important as the raid on IE, on an IED maker's compound as a campaign afterward to put out the message of why we were there and the evidence to prove that he was in fact an IED maker. Uh, a good example and very much a deliberate strike on a, in a facili facilitator compound in my area of operations. You know, every intelligence source that we had pointed to these guys being bad. We couldn't get there physically, geographically for two days. By the time we were able to move to the the place where um, you know, we had conducted this strike, the population had already been manipulated into believing that uh, we had innocently killed, or we had killed innocent men, uh, women, and children. Um, none of which was true, but again, it doesn't matter. You got to be there. You got to be in their backyard. You got to be engaging them as soon as you take lethal actions. As important as the lethal action that you take is the message you get out afterwards.
kind of want to get into how we lived day in and day out, life on a command outpost, if you will. We were isolated with no access to rural roads. Everything came in by air. You can kind of see here, uh, that's what we call a CDS drop. So basically those are uh, card, not cardboard, but uh, wood boxes kind of descend by parachute with all the supplies we would get. We would call it in, they would drop it, and then it was a race between us and the Afghans to get there first. If they land outside your cop, it was a 100 meter dash uh, to get there before they could. The two lucky gentlemen there are taking care of the fecal matter on our cop. Uh, a healthy dose of diesel and uh, a tin can took care, took care of that. On your way to the bathroom, you always carried a flashlight because when you went into the bathroom, you always wanted to take a, a quick shine down inside of this makeshift porta potty that we had created. Because generally speaking, there was a nest of pythons that usually liked to hang out. So, didn't want to get caught with your pants down in there. <laughs> the first two months while we were in Afghanistan, uh, we choked down army provided meals ready to eat. At 2,000 calories each, they sat like a brick in your lower intestine and didn't like to leave. Uh, at the rec recommendation of my prede predecessor, I carried a a gangster roll of about $2,000 in my back pocket and finally went out to the local population, employed a cook. And uh, from that point on, we ate, we ate pretty well. Uh, I can't complain. We had, generally speaking, you walk out in the morning and there'd be three or four goats hanging from the two trees that were in our, on our compound. And uh, by lunchtime, we'd had a pretty good meal. Uh, usually goat or chicken. Uh, additionally, we'd have some local vegetables, okra is particularly big in that part of, the, part of the world, corn and some tomatoes. So we ate pretty well, and then uh, obviously bread, or naan as they call it in Afghanistan, is, uh, is a pretty big staple. And uh, as long as you don't watch the way they cook it, you know, they use their feet, they pound out the, the round naan bread, and then they slap it on the side of a dung oven. So as long as you don't worry about where it came from or you stop to think about it, you you were able to choke it down. <laughs> Additionally, we lived with a partner force. So on the COP itself, on the COP is a command outpost. If I, if there's a weird acronym, raise your hand real quick and I'll try to, to you know, sometimes I slide back into acronyms, Army speak. Um, the COP, the command outpost we lived on, also had about 60 Afghan National Army guys who were partnered with us for defense of the base and they also conducted day-to-day -day operations throughout the corner of the River Valley with us. Their competence varied. We had seasoned uh, Mujahideen guys that had fought the Russians years earlier. And we also had, we had 15 year olds who just like our young soldiers needed some motivation to get their job done. All in all, I admired them and the partnership and respect grew throughout the deployment. Uh, I, I really knew the partnership had solidified when we lost our first soldier. Um, the Afghan commander came over to me and, you know, he was amazing, he was a real good guy and he, he you know, in traditional fashion was uh, very respectful of the soldier we had lost and then pulled all, offered and did pull all of our guys out of the towers that surround our base for 24 hours. He took all the force protection, the, the various towers on the base and allowed our guys to mourn and grieve, which I thought was an amazing gesture from a, a guy that didn't speak our own language. So. Um, capable, well-intentioned folks that are truly uh, forging a great partnership with us over there. And uh, these guys, on a daily base, basis, were at a constant state of readiness. We had to live in fortified positions because of the threat of attack. Our living quarters were generally a hodgepodge of HESCO baskets. And HESCO baskets are uh, they're pretty much metal on each side with a little bit of uh, vinyl on the inside and you fill it with whatever you can to stop bullets that are coming into your camp. Additionally, we, we stacked sandbags and whatever wood we could uh, have flown in to create what kind of looked like a Swiss Family Robinson treehouse. You know, you built it into the side of, of rocks and used whatever you could and it was really our makeshift way of creating a force protection uh, scenario where we were, at least the one we were behind, you know, that cover, we were, we were safe from incoming fire. Uh, the young men that were with me there endured 127 attacks of varying degrees on what became our home, five of which were conducted by 100 enemy or more. One where the enemy was physically in our perimeter 
and fought off by an incredible individual effort by the guy on the left right here. Okay. The business these soldiers were involved in was serious and the consequences of not performing were incredibly dire. Who are the people of Kunar? All right, generally speaking, the majority of the population is Wahhabi, uh, the most uh, secular form of Islam, extraordinarily devout. Generally speaking, they're, they're vastly uneducated. Afghanistan is estimated to have about between a 17 and 25% literacy rate, depending on who you ask. Uh, the people of Kunar, where we resided, were bringing that average down. So. Um, the Shura of 35 local, el of, of local elders, that's the, the Shura is the meeting that we would bring together to talk about security issues and development issues where we could plan projects and whatnot for the local villages. Five were able to read, five of those 35, and they were the representatives, the elders, the senior statesmen for their respective, respective villages. That said, they are not dumb, um, but again, uh, this is another limiting factor when you're trying to engage them. You know, written documents aren't, aren't going to do you any good. You really had to be able to vocally communicate what it is you were trying to get across and when you were trying to influence them. Uh, they're very much a subsistent farming population, very dependent on seasonal rains to ensure they had food. This resulted in famine most years. And uh, primitive agricultural practices also contri contributed to the, to, uh, to, to the problems they had there. Oftentimes they were using the wrong type of seed. Uh, they weren't using the type of seed that would yield appropriate to the environment they were in. Um, they were very steadfast in the way they did things because they had been they've been surviving for years and years. They're resistant to change because they're worried about surviving. They're going to stick with what generally works, even if it's not the most efficient or productive way of doing things. They're a very patriarchal patriarchal uh, culture. Men rule, aspects, men rule all aspects of life. Women have no voice in the culture, and the oldest man in the culture really dictates what the family's gonna do. So if you're the grandfather and you've got 16 sons, all the money filters from those sons to him, and he disperses it how he sees fit. That, uh, generally speaking, is how, you, uh, how they, they deal day to day. Generally speaking, you want to engage with that oldest male, because he was the one that affected change and he was able to influence his family. Women are completely subservient. If you're, a woman over, if you're a woman over the age of 12 and under the age of 65, you remain completely covered and completely sequestered from Westerners. I never saw the face of a woman between those ages. You would see little girls and older women faces, but interaction was limited even with them. And again, I just want to reiterate, they're a very hard culture and they're focused on survival. They're incredibly resilient, able to live on nothing, they cherish the little they have, and males are incredibly hospitable to other males. My interactions with them, generally speaking, if we, you know, they could have been doing things behind my back, but when I visited them day to day, I was very impressed by their hospitality. And again, that gets back to the whole theme of Pashtun Wali in my culture. All right, who is the American soldier? This is why I think I have the best job in the world. I get to work with these guys. Um, they come from various walks of life. Who here is 17 or 18 years old? Okay. I had 16 soldiers in my platoon that were your age. The youngest guy I had was 17 years old and eight months. I'd ask who was over 46 in here, but there'd be a lot of hands and I might get, <laughs> I might get yelled at later. But the oldest, guy I, uh, the oldest guy I had in my platoon was uh, 46 years old. He was a specialist which is the fourth lowest rank in the Army. He's one of the smartest guys that had two master's degrees, served because he wanted to. Um, you get guys from all various walks of life, creeds, so on and so forth. Five different races and ethnicities represented in my platoon. Everyone had a minimum of a high school education. Nine soldiers had a bachelor's degree of some sort. And again, two soldiers had a master's degree, neither of which, uh, neither of those soldiers is me. I don't have a master's degree. Um, Roughly half were married with children. Soldiers are incredibly versatile and adaptive. I quickly realized I was not, the, I was not talented enough or smart enough to get my hands around all the facets of what we were doing in Afghanistan. 
I had to empower young, talented soldiers to come up with creative solutions to problems. Really leveling the playing field and giving guys the opportunity to succeed and do things outside what they thought their sphere of influence was did wonders for us. Uh, one example I think of is that a guy had a great agricultural background and he was able to bring in and work through the FDA to bring in the right kind of seed to yield uh, more tomatoes in the area we were doing, which just did wonders for us in our interactions with the local population. Little things like that really go a long way to get a little bit of buy-in from these people. Each soldier is strategically impactful, whether they know it or not. And uh, the concept of the strategic private and how one individual can have a big uh, effect on whatever is going on in Afghanistan. <coughs> Bring your attention to the guy here in the hard boxers here to the left. <laughs> the guy in my platoon, you know, asleep in his rack. We uh, start taking fire from over this way. He runs out to support his buddies. Who am I to tell him what to wear? Uh, heart boxers, Valentine's Day, figured it was appropriate. New York Times reporter was embedded with us that day, a guy by the name of Tim Hedrington. He snapped a photo, ended up on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> Get a call from uh, my commander within about 24 hours. <laughs> He gets a call from his commander within 24 hours. And before you know it, everyone wants to know what's going, out, going on in the Korngal Valley in Kunar province. So little things like that, you don't think a soldier has a strategic impact on the big picture. Um, believe it or not, the awareness that he brought to the American public drove resources to our, to our cop. Generals and, and congressmen became involved and they wanted to to make sure that the guy was taken care of. So, you know, whatever it takes. You know, the funny story aside, guys make strategic decisions on a daily basis. You know, the decision to pull a trigger can be a strategic one. We're seeing a lot of these issues right now with the Koran uh, burnings and uh, the issue with the, uh, the, the dead that uh, we had with the Marines in the last quarter. Um, all these things, the actions of a soldier can have a strategic impact and affect the way we're doing things every day. Um, soldiers want to know they matter. They want to look back at an American population that not only supports them, but understands what it is they are doing. They're looking for a watchdog to protect their interests. They're serving at the behest of the people and counting them to be critical of why they're there and why they're being set into harm's way. The fact that you guys are here today to uh, hear what my guys did is, is a credit to you and will make you more responsible and understand what it is we're doing and why we're there. Uh, lastly, they're looking to be led. They're constantly critiquing their leadership. They know when you're, you're blowing smoke and you're, you're, not being, uh, you're not being honest with them. You can't be fake in front of these guys. Either, you either got it or you don't. You put up or you shut up and uh, Generally speaking, they deserve that. So um, it was and always has been my privilege to serve for these guys, and it was my driving motivation every day. So I am uh, extremely impressed by the American soldier, and a good example is this guy. He's from right over here in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He had already been shot twice. He had shot through the shoulder here, and he got shot in the leg, returned to duty on both occasions, never left country, he came back, volunteered to come back. Third time, took a round in the chest right here, exploded all the magazines in his chest, got a bunch of shrapnel in his face. Here he is smiling, um, put him on an aircraft, kicking and screaming, didn't want to leave. Uh, the next day, got in a convoy 360 miles through IED laden areas to get back to us. You know, it's just a testament to the fortitude of guys that are doing great things every day. He's one of them. And he's still out there doing good stuff for God and country. Who's the enemy? Who are we fighting? Generally speaking, I'd say it's about 50-50. Homegrown versus foreign fighters of some kind. All right? The predominance of the guys that I saw, I'm just going to kind of go through. Um, obviously, the homegrown or influence to fight the guys that are, are local to the area, that someone comes in from out of town, someone with money, a facilitator, has a little bit of influence and they're able to get them to do what it is they want them to do. 
he had varied degrees of talent when he, when those guys fight. Some of them are good, some of them have experience, some of them don't. Um, you get all sorts. L.E.T., Lashkari Taiba, vehemently work toward the establishment of a glo global Islamic caliphate. They're unique because they don't discriminate as a result, as a result of ethnicity. Um, oftentimes you'd see people, Caucasian folks, that were L.E.T. fighters. It's, you know, very awkward to be looking through one end of a bino at a guy shooting at you and he looks exactly like you do. Um, very much the case and often that was a, an L.E.T. fighter. Lashkar Taiba. Chechens, they're Muslim, highly lethal, well-trained folks, and their motivation is generally money. They're more or less guns for hire. Uh, Al-Qaeda uses them generally um, because they're good at what they do. They're great snipers. Um, they maneuver incredibly well and they're incredibly violent and lethal. Obviously, Al-Qaeda often facilitate operations at a higher level and align where necessary to accomplish their goals. Uh, Generally in our area, they were Saudi or Egyptian, and they have the lion's share of the funds to facilitate operations. They're pulling the strings, making sure the enemy's operations are going the way they want them to. Uh, the Taliban pervades our area. Hekmatar Global Dean, very tied to the local population and works with anyone to attain common goals. They can facilitate large-scale attacks. Most of the big attacks we saw were Taliban-led and Al-Qaeda facilitated. So they were, the Al-Qaeda was funding it and the Taliban was conducting it with very little help from the local population. And then lastly, kind of an external government actor is ISI, Pakistani Intelligence Service, who, generally speaking, attacked only infrastructure, uh, very covert and professionally executed, and they're more focused on ensuring instability than targeting Americans. Go after schools, government centers. Um, they didn't so much want to target Americans, they just wanted to ensure that Afghanistan remains an unstable place on their western border. ISI, typical operation. The reason I kind of take you through all these different things is you have to engage the enemy. You have to know the enemy to engage them. If you, don't, if you understand who they are, what their motives are, um, you can create a cogent, thorough response to go after them. Obviously, um, if you're going to be fighting a homegrown uh, enemy a guy that's a, a local villager who takes pop shots at you and you're going to respond with you know everything the US Air Force has to bring you know probably not in your best interest to do so because you're going to affect that local population a lot more if you can avoid pulling the trigger if you can avoid dropping that bomb you get a lot more bang for your buck if it's just going to be harassing fire from those guys if you can get uh, the intelligence to support an operation against Al Qaeda the Taliban and so on and so forth you want to try to engage them away from the population in areas that you know don't affect the population writ large. Lastly, um, like I've been saying, uh, the enemy has a vote. They are incredibly talented, and every day I gain more and more respect for them. And I kind of want to take you through a vignette of one of my scenarios, or one of the situations I was in. Uh, September 17, 2008, was one of the tougher days uh, for me in Afghanistan. Uh, fellow platoon leader, this is not my area of operations, this is kind of north of where I was. Um, a fellow platoon leader and I, a guy I really respected, a real talented guy, uh, Ivy League uh, graduate, really understood the interaction with the local population. He knew how to work through good governance, he knew how to established political systems. He, he really had it down. He was really making inroads with the local population and quelling violence in his area. Um, so when he came to me with a, a plan, an operation to clear a village north of some of the political centers that he was trying to stand up and support, I was on board. I really respected this guy and um, hopped on board with this plan. Um, my part of the mission basically was I was going to air assault in. I was going to fly in my helicopter land up here on this peak. They were going to be clearing the village down below. I was going to be their eyes in the sky, kind of providing overwatch for them as they cleared the village. This village was known to be facilitating um, specifically the Taliban, uh, Golbuddin Hekmatar in this area. Um, and we were going to provide overwatch for them where they cleared and found caches and were able to inter interrogate and talk to people in that village. They came in by ground north, 
cleared the village, I was on, on the hill uh, working all the assets above them. So we had various F-16s and all sorts of assets on the station to support their, support their movement. They were able to clear the village. They found 500 pounds of HME, homemade explosives, uh, various caches of weapons, all sorts of stuff that indicated that the intelligence that we were getting was correct. Um, throughout the day, I was getting a lot of intelligence reports from higher that suggested that there was going to be an attack on us. So we were very much at a heightened state of readiness, and that attack never came to fruition. Our extraction from the area was going to be by helicopter as well, uh, but at the last minute, the aircraft got grounded and we had to be <coughs> taken out by ground. We were going to get in Humvees and drive. Um, we had to walk, descend down about 3,000 feet from up here down to the village and get extracted by my platoon who was coming from the north and we were going to go south to my fellow platoon leader's base. Uh, in my discussions we, with the other platoon leader, he, he kind of uh, indicated that he was going to push south without the support that had gone off station. So when I say gone off station, the aircraft left to get fuel. Um, I was controlling them. I had been controlling them all day. He said, I'm going to go ahead and push uh, south without the support of the aircraft down in the valley. In the back of my head, I was, uh, I was concerned because I had been hearing these intelligence reports that suggested attack and it hadn't come yet. And I wasn't, it wasn't quite sitting well with me that, um, that nothing came of that. Generally speaking, the amount of reporting that was coming in, I was expecting an attack. Nonetheless, I argued back and forth with him at the end of the day. As a guy I respected, my instincts told me differently, but I allowed him to kind of go south. Before he left, he uh, had a soldier that was a heat casualty. He had, uh, he had fallen victim to the heat. He was, uh, he was hurting, so they put him in the back of the Humvee. He asked if, I could use, if he could use one of my gunners for his, his vehicle. I gave him one of my gunners, not thinking, thinking about it, he ended up tagging along, one of my soldiers tagging along with him, and they headed south. Uh, the thinking being, if you do make contact or you do get engaged with the enemy, you have a little bit of separation between you and that other force so that, you know, if one needs to fight to the other, you, you can do that. They head south. Um, the air doesn't come on station like it's supposed to. Um, they head here, and eventually I start getting uncomfortable, and I say, we're going we're gonna to push south either way. Um, we get to about here, the platoon is, is here, and they end up running into an incredibly complex ambush. 227 enemy fighters were situated in the hills. At a stacked ambush, two Dishka positions at each of these X's. Dishka is a, a heavy weapon, shoots a 50 caliber round, it's about that big. The guys you know, continued south, there were guys down below with RPGs that um, stopped the first vehicle in its tracks. That vehicle was, it was dead in place, um, injuring, <coughs> blinding the, the TC, and severely wounding the driver. The driver. Effectively, they, they couldn't maneuver. Their radio comms went out. Uh, the tough thing about all this for me was the Individual that I gave over to the other platoon, the soldier, a guy by the name of Brandon Farley, unbelievable guy, his wife Holly, just had their first baby six days prior to this. He was killed uh, in actions in this area. So, you know, tough stuff, um, tough situation. Decisions matter, you know. Um, both myself and the other platoon leader spent countless hours, sleepless nights, planning the operation. At the end of the day, the enemy gets a vote. They're very good. Um, I take solace in knowing that I did the best I could. But, you know, <coughs> planning and, and everything you do still can result in the death of a soldier, as you can see. Uh, again, very tough situation for my guys and for the platoon. Here's kind of the, uh, the area where this all went down. You can see the burnout uh, hulls of the, the two Humvees that we, were, we had to push off the cliff there. Um, so 
So basically the takeaway from that is that the enemy is good. You can't, you can't deny the fact that they are going to be successful and they're going to get a vote and they're going to have influence in whatever area they're at. Um, people often ask, you know, would they be fighting us here if they weren't fighting, fighting us there? And I, I say yes and no. Um, from time to time, when you see an attack like that, you can't help but think that if they're that coordinated and that talented and that prepared to fight American soldiers there, that they wouldn't be able to bring that same, um, that same planning and, and, and whatnot to bear here.